Good morning. Would you stand for our opening hymn? And welcome to Lutheran Church of the Lakes on this beautiful Sunday in May the Lord has given us to gather here. And what a great way to begin our week, to uh, join together to worship our Lord and Savior, sing His praises, be fed by His Word and sacrament, and to encourage one another in the great mission God has given us to share the good news of His Son. We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner.
we confess together. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our intro at this morning is taken from Psalm 66. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip? Blessed be God because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come and hear, all you who fear God and I will tell what he has done for my soul. <clears throat> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading for the sixth Sunday of Easter is from the book of Acts, the 10th chapter. Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on the tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all people, but to us, who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even to Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Epistles from the first letter of John, the fifth chapter. Everyone who believes that Jesus, Christ, in, that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise. The Holy Gospel is from John, the 15th chapter. 
Glory to you, O Lord. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Heavenly Father, for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning continues uh, in the uh, book of John, chapter 15, or the gospel of John, chapter 15. Remember, this is all of this takes place while Jesus is in the upper room, uh, getting ready to celebrate the uh, Passover with his disciples. He has already washed their feet. Um, he has already given them the I am the vine and you are the branches teaching. And these are the very next things that he says to them. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Now, as Christians, when we hear the word commandments, what's the very first thing that comes to mind? The Ten Commandments, right? And I get it. Um, that's just kind of ingrained in us. But is that what Jesus is talking about? Uh, to us. If we keep the, the Ten Commandments, then we are abiding in Him. And I'm going to argue the answer to that question is no. Um, Jesus 
in keeping his father's commandments. Those were part of his work, what he had to do, keep the law of God perfectly. Okay? But it's my thoughts, um, and actually a few smarter folks than me, that the commandment that Jesus is talking about is a unique commandment from him. I want to share with you um, a couple other verses that talk about this commandment. Uh, so, just a few chapters earlier, John 13. Um, and this is when he finishes washing his disciples' feet. He says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And then in the epistle of 1 John chapter 3, the uh, apostle reports this. He says, And this is his, Jesus' commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son. All right, I'm sorry, this is God's commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. So you look at these commandments, and even later on in our gospel reading, Jesus is going to repeat the same thing, that the command is going to be to love one another. So my contention is, is that's the commandment that Jesus is calling us to, is to love one another. Now, the temptation that Satan gives to us is to allow us to define what love is. All right? And I want you to uh, resist that temptation. I'm going to argue as we go through this um, that God is the one who gets to define what love is. I know in my career I, I've counseled many people and I remember clearly talking to a husband who was very verbally abusive to both his spouse and to his children, and yet he would look at you with all sincerity and tell you how much he loved his family. And I keep thinking to myself, dude, you have a different definition of love than I do and than what the Scriptures do. So hold that thought. All right, the commandment that Jesus is telling us to obey is to love one another. But we're going to see how God defines that word love. And you'll notice that part of the command is to believe in Jesus Christ um, as the Son of God. And so you have uh, an element of faith. So to believe, you have to have faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, so you have this abide by faith in Jesus so that we can love one another. He continues, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. What is he talking about? to have God's people and have their joy be full. Well, there is actually some Old Testament roots to this phrase, um, this figure of speech that Jesus is using, and I want to investigate those for a second. I want to read to you from the book, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people will be take, he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord who we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So this rejoicing where God swallows up death forever, where does that happen? And how does that happen? It happens with the death and resurrection of God's Son. And how does it happen? 
It happens by Jesus sacrificing Himself for us. So you can say, based on the Old Testament, that this fullness of joy is really a phrase that points to the coming of the Messiah. I want you to grab your Bibles because there's another verse I want to share with you that bears this out. And we're going to turn to the prophet Zephaniah, chapter 3. That's on page 940. Zephaniah, chapter 3, pages 940. And if you are one of those folks who uh, has the discipline to mem- memorize some larger passages of Scripture, um, this is an amazing chunk. Even taking the few verses that follow this, they're some of the most wonderful, comforting verses in all of Scripture. Zephaniah chapter 3, page 940. Zephaniah chapter 3, page 940. And we're going to look particularly at verses 14 and 15. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you and has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. So what gets God's people to rejoice and exult with all their heart? To have their heart full of this rejoicing, of this joy, where God has taken away the judgments against you. Again, where and how has God done this? This is only on the cross. Because the judgments that were against us, how did God take them away? He heaped them upon His own Son. And then He condemned His own Son in our stead. And so when you have this phrase in the New Testament, this fullness of joy that Jesus is talking about, He's pointing to the coming of the Messiah. And again, the context of this is wonderful because what? This is the night that he is betrayed. The apostles in a few short days are going to see what? The fulfillment of this promise that the entire Old Testament is pointing to. That God's people have waited for years. And the fulfillment of that promise is going to bring about the fullness of joy. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. So what does it mean to be a friend of Jesus? A friend of God? Has he used that language before? And the answer, of course, is yes. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Don't look it up. I'm just going to read it to you. Verse 7. Did you not... Our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. So the Old Testament says that Abraham was God's friend. Exodus chapter 33, verse 11a. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Friend. So you have the word friend in the Old Testament used for Abraham, used for Moses, and now Jesus is doing what? 
saying that we are his friends. What connection do Abraham and Moses both have that marks them as these friends of God? They have a connection of the covenant, right? If you think about <clears throat> the first covenant, the old covenant, where did it begin? It began with Abraham. And so you have God who makes this covenant with Abraham and calls Abraham his friend. And of course, you can't talk about the old covenant without talking about Moses, right? Moses was the friend whom God used to deliver his law, the staple part of the first covenant, to God's people. And so they have this connection of covenant. But I've intentionally used the word first covenant and old covenant because I do believe that there is a new covenant that God has made with his people. After the coming of God's Son, after the Christ. And so in the same way, as Abraham and Moses were called friends and they were connected to God by a covenant in the same way we too are connected to God by a covenant. And we are connected in a way that I think Abraham and Moses would be exceedingly jealous of. Because how has God sealed His covenant with us? He has given us whom? The Holy Spirit. This amazing gift. His own presence within us. As we are united to Christ in our baptism, the Holy Spirit then dwells within us. A sign of this covenant. But, also notice, when the Old Testament called Abraham and Moses friends of God, what, how, how, what did God ask of them? God both called them, right? He called them both out of their present situation. He called Abraham to leave his father's house. He called Moses to leave his self-imposed exile and to go and to serve him. So the friends of God are called and they are sent. Does that ring a bell for us in the new covenant? Are we called by God? And the answer is absolutely. And are we sent? And of course the answer is Absolutely. Also notice, because remember I told you I was not going to let you define what love is. How does Jesus add to the definition of what love is? Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And of course, what meaning those words must have taken on to the disciples in the next few days as they watched the Son of God die and be raised again to life. And as Jesus opened up their minds to the Scriptures, those words had to have been unbelievably meaningful to God's disciples. Because Jesus showed them the greatest act of love, right? And it was the sacrifice. Putting others first. And of course, that's always the temptation because how does the world love? How does Satan encourage people to love? To always put the self first. But Jesus and our Heavenly Father always turn things upside down. And Jesus introduces this radical notion that love means to sacrifice, put the other person first. Gang, what happens in a marriage when husbands put themselves first and wives put themselves first? What happens? Brokenness. Dysfunction. Right? 
Because Jesus tells us what? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. What did he do? He put us first. He sacrificed the self for the beloved. And it's that act of self-sacrifice that moves us, that shows us how we are to love one another. Verse 16 of our Gospel reading. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Grab your Bibles again. And I want you to turn to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7. That's on page 179. Deuteronomy, chapter 7, page 179. Deuteronomy, chapter 7, page 179. And we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Notice the number of times that we are reminded that God has chosen us. And please also note the reason why God chose us. And did it have anything to do with us? And the answer is no. He didn't choose the Israelites because they were better. He chose to love them. Now again, this adds another piece to the definition of what it means to love. I've preached to you this sermon already, reminding you that love is a choice. Love is a decision. Because Christians wrestle with this all the time, right? Why does God love me? Because truly he shouldn't. But if love is a choice, that means he controls it. He gets to make it. And you want to know why you are the object of God's love? Simply because he has chosen to love us. There was nothing inherently in us that would be desirable for God to choose us. In fact, just the opposite. But please notice how this contrasts with how human beings normally love. We usually look for something that is lovable, right? And then we respond to that. But God does not. When God chooses to love us, that is what creates love in us. So notice now that when we, defi- when we let God define love, it involves the behavior of love, the self-sacrifice, putting others first. And the origin of that love is choice. Because God has chosen to love us 
and sacrifice Himself for us, we can do what? Choose to love our neighbor. Please notice this isn't because there is anything in our neighbor that is lovable, just the opposite, right? It's an exact reflection of how God chooses to love us. Gang, I don't know how many sermons I have preached throughout my career. It's in the thousands, and I remember very few of my own words. But I remember a children's sermon I gave one Christmas Eve. I had one of our uh, trustees. He was a friend of mine, and he was so thrilled uh, because he had bought himself uh, uh, one... One million lumen spotlight. He's a guy, right? So bigger is always better. One million lumen spotlight. It was this big old thing, and you could hold on to it with a hand, and it took an enormous amount of batteries. And I said, hey, brother, can you bring that to our, Christ- our children's service on Christmas Eve? And I told him to get up in the balcony, and when I gave him the signal... I wanted him to shine it on me. And so I had the other volunteers at worship that night dim all the house lights. And so everything was completely dark. And he takes that spotlight and he zaps it on. And of course, this big old focused beam. But what I didn't tell him is that I brought a nice big mirror And I took that reflected light. It worked perfectly because the beam was so focused. And I took my mirror and I shined it around the whole place and shined it on the kids. And of course, because it was like a million lumens, it was like blindingly and they had to like cover their eyes, right? But I reminded them that as Christians, we are not the source of the light. All we do is receive the light and reflect it. God is the source. And the same thing for His love. We are not the source of our love, right? That's the commandment that Jesus gave to us. That we love one another. But we are not the source. We receive God's love first. Remember, He has chosen to love us. There was nothing within us that was lovable, but He chose to love us. And then He laid down His life for us. And in the same way, as we obey this command that God has given us, all we do is reflect what God has first lavished upon us. All that we do is pass on the same grace and mercy and love that we have received on to others. And as we do that, that's how we abide in Christ. That's how God works through us to make fruit. Simply by reflecting and passing on that same love and grace and mercy that God has first given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.